Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Tent of Abraham. I'm Tamir Kreisman from Jerusalem, Israel, and we continue with Pirkei Dorabi Eliezer. We pick up right where we left off. We're on the Golden Calf, chapter 45. This is 45C. And this one is called Trying Times. All the Torah that comes from this and the knowledge that comes from this, we give it to the protection of our soldiers and we pray for the swift return of our hostages. So again, we're just continuing right where we left off, uh, just as Moses is telling God that Israel are his people, despite what was going on. Moses then took the tablets and he descended. And the writing on the tablets were the ones carrying the tablets as well as Moses with them. This is the same concept as the Ark of the Covenant, which carried those who carried it, as said in Masechet Sotah 35a. Now these tablets, they were big. Together they made a perfect square. So they were like, think of a, think of a massive, big, perfect square, cut it directly down in half, that's what the tablets uh, were like. Now, our sages estimate the weight of these tablets were anywhere between 450 and 800 kilos. And they said the, the, the stuff that it was closest resembling to was actually sapphire. So, again, massive, a uh, regular human being would not be able to carry this. This entire thing, just like the Ark, was a complete miracle. So, this is not like what we saw, you know, the depiction of the tablets that we saw in the Ten Commandments movie or anywhere else, right? They're not going to do that. But as Moses approached the shenanigans and the festivities with the golden calf, and the letters saw the drums and the dancing and all the debauchery going on there, they themselves fled uh, the tablets and flew away. The letters, right? So what is this? Now, I know we have to keep reminding people to suspend your disbelief when it comes to the Torah. These were different times, all right? With different governance in the world, far from what we actually see today. It's nowhere near what the world was like back then. And so if you believe the ten plagues and the splitting of the sea and all the other signs and wonders that God did for Israel, then believe this as well, okay? But let's go back to uh, what we're saying over here. If you read the preface of the Zohar, Hakdamat HaZohar, you will see that the letters have their own personalities and characteristics, not to mention their own consciousness. They each had conversations with God. God created them, right? And like the rest of all creation, except for man, they exist for one singular purpose, and that is to serve their creator. Man is the only one with free will. As we've been teaching, there is only one holy tongue, that is Hebrew, and that is the language by which God spoke reality into existence. It will also be the language left speaking in the world in the days of Mashiach, because at that time only the holy shall remain. So we can see the plain text makes a distinction between the tablets before and after we see. What was coming from Exodus 32, 15 to 19. Now Moses turned and went down from the mountain bearing the two tablets of testimony. Remember that, okay? In his hand, tablets inscribed from both the sides on one side and on the other side, they were inscribed. In, the, in other words, if you're looking at, let's say, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, He, right? the first five letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and if you're looking at them from this side, they are exactly this, from the same direction through. So you could like look through them, but you would still, from the other side, you would still see the same thing as a person would see from this side, which physically makes no sense. The way I keep thinking about this is like, um, if you're looking at the Sfirot, right? When we look at the Sfirot, if that comes from the throne of God, so it comes from the throne of God. In other words, if you're standing before the throne of God, the right side of the throne should be your left side. But the way it comes out, although it is the right and the left, meaning the right is, the, is your left and the left is your right, the way it comes out and is relevant to you is as it comes out from God. So the right, even though it is your left, becomes your right. You see what I'm saying? In other words, it kind of flips, but it doesn't flip. That's the, that's the uh, unnatural way of these things. The way it comes out is kind of the same way and direction that is received. 
Okay, let's continue. I hope that didn't confuse you too much. Now, the tablets were God's work, and the inscription was God's inscription engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the voice of the people and their shouting, he said to Moses, There is a voice of battle in the camp. But Moses said, It is neither a voice shouting victory nor a voice shouting defeat. A voice of blasphemy I hear. Now it came to pass when he drew closer to the camp and saw the calf and the dances that Moses' anger was kindled, and he flung the tablets from his hands, right? Shattering them at the foot of the mountain. So at first, the text calls them the tablets of testimony. And then in the next two verses, it, is, it explains why what went down, as they were written by the finger of God. But when Moses drew closer to the camp, they were simply the tablets as the letters had left. No testimony here anymore. Now, this was the pinnacle when it came to the actual writing of Hebrew. But look at how we all treat our Torah scroll, uh, scrolls today. I mean, real Jews anyway, right? I've seen, you know, in other places, they'll open up a Torah scroll. It's just another book throwing things on it, whatever, Okay. You hold a Torah scroll like you hold a child, like you hold a baby. You can never place it on the ground. So long as the carrier of the Torah is on his feet, so too are the entire congregation. When you open the ark, right? Everybody stands up. So when the Torah is taken out of the ark and returned back after reading, we sing psalms and praise for what he gave us, for what God gave us. In the words of David, the sweet singer of Zion, the Torah is always escorted. When you want to take the Torah from one ark to another, because where I live right now, there are several little makeshift synagogues, because there's not actually a synagogue built. So there are minyanim in like, you know, little closets and minyanim in the schools. When they take the Torah scroll from the main ark to one of the other minyanim, you have to cover it in a talis when you walk with it in the street, and you have to have people escorting the person holding the Torah scroll. This is not a small deal. You have to understand. And if, God forbid, the Torah scroll is dropped on the floor, let's say, in a synagogue, if it falls on the floor, if it touches the floor, the entire congregation must be in mourning for 40 days and do a 40 day fast. Okay. That's days, not nights. In other words, from sun up to sundown, you cannot eat and you have to lament for 40 days because this is likened to what happened over there. And th these are, these are all true halachat. Okay. The same that the same time that Moses spent on the mountain after the breaking of the first tablets and, you know, begging for God's forgiveness. God forbid this happens today. This is what happens. The scrolls are placed then in an ark under lock and key. Many times these arcs are fireproof for obvious reasons. I just uh, saw like there was a video a few weeks ago someplace in, uh, I forgot, somewhere in the States with thousands of Orthodox Jews who should be here but are there. The, they, they had a, a synagogue, makeshift synagogue next to the, one of the people's houses. The whole thing burnt down and it even got to the Torah scrolls. The Torah scrolls were burnt. That is a sign for the entire community that they didn't seem to understand. Again, people are not reading They're like, oh, okay, so yes, we came together as a community and was really sad for all of us. God is the one that does these things. So if God burdens his own world, a word from your synagogues outside the land of Israel, maybe the authority or the leaders of that congregation should say, maybe we no longer need to be here. This is a purpose. This is a point that I'm trying to make. You you must understand what I'm saying is biblical. It is halachic, is rabbinical. If Jews dwell outside the land of Israel, they are the ones that are postponing and delaying the redemption. So I got issues with that. Okay. So this is the word of God written by a scribe. This is what a Torah is written by a scribe who is who has to completely purify himself. He has to immerse himself, go into the mikvah, right? Um, to levels that uh, levels that we can't really actually we don't do on our, our daily basis. But for instance, every time he writes the the explicit name of God, he has to go back into the mikvah and do it again. He can't have impure thoughts when this is done while he's writing each and every letter. That's how intense this whole process is. Okay, he's making manifest the word that God spoke us all into existence. So this is a big deal. When a new Torah scroll is completed by a scribe, which often can take the better part of a year, and is handed to a synagogue, they hold a grand party for the sake of God's Torah. 
This net, there's, it's called Hachnasat Sefer Torah, the bringing in of a Torah scroll. This, by the way, again, I know how it's done in all the idolatrous places. This is never to take place on Shabbat. This is not to take place on Shabbat. You don't want to take away from the holiness of Shabbat. Okay? This happens any time during the week. Then there's a Kiddush and there's dancing and there's singing and they par- they do parades through the street with for one synagogue throughout the entire city. It doesn't matter. It's such a beautiful thing to behold. All right. Um, anyway, so even your study books, it's not only about the actual Torah scrolls written by a scribe on a parchment, but your study books, any one of these books here, okay, from your Tanakh to your commentary by your sages, all these are holy writings and they should never be face down, placed upside down on the shelf, right? If I got this like over here, Zara Kodesh. Upside down, you never put it upside down. It should never be placed face down like this. If anything, only faced up, right? And you never lay anything on top of it. You could put other books, holy books on top of it. You can't put so much as a pen on top of a holy book that disrespects the Torah because it's all part of the Torah. These are all extensions, right? Um. So you also have to uh, you also have to pay attention if you leave. Let's say if you're studying and the book is open and you leave the room, you have to close the book. You can't just keep a book open. That's how much we go. That's how how far we go. And even if there are no books and you're either talking Torah or saying a blessing, you have to make sure that you are covered modestly and not in a place of impurity. For instance, this here this is like one corner of my office. Some of you, I've shown it to you on camera. Some of you from the group, you've actually seen it. This is my office. This is, it's filled with holy books. That's what's going on here. In this room, I make sure to not walk around half naked. You know what I'm saying? I make sure to uh, not speak of things that are not relevant to God and the Torah because I'm surrounded by holiness. That's how far we go. All right. Okay, and on and on and on and on and on. Now, this is how careful we must be when it comes to the written or spoken word of God. And now you have a better idea of what the letters themselves, the ones written by the finger of God, left before they witnessed what Moses was about to see. So, the letters saw the drums and the dancing and the debauchery. They themselves fled the tablets and flew away, and they, the tablets, were too heavy for Moses, because the writing themselves is what kept everything afloat. Now, what made the tablets holy? The letters or the tablets themselves? What do you think? Just think about it for a second. Obviously, we're going to go through it, all right? The answer is both. Because what were the first tablets made of? By reading what happens in Exodus 34, we can see that there is a difference between the first and second tablets. Um, So from 34, one says, And the Lord said to Moses, Hew for yourself two stone tablets like the first ones. Okay? Be prepared for morning, and in the morning you shall ascend Mount Sinai and stand before me there on the top of the mountain. No one shall ascend with you, neither shall anyone be seen anywhere on the mountain, neither shall the sheep and the cattle graze facing that mountain. So Moses hewed two stone tablets like the first ones. Why like the first ones? Well, we understand, we'll understand. Um, Like the first ones, and Moses arose early in the morning and ascended Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, and he took two stone tablets in his hand. This is also a very impressive feat if you think about it. So if the second tablets were fashioned by Moses from stone, which matched the size of the first tablets, before God inscribed the letters on it with his finger, how could Moses lug them up the mountain if he could not hold the first ones? So we already know they are likely not from the same material, right? It's not that original material. These are two stone tablets. What did Moses have in his hands when he ascended the first time? Exodus 24, 18. And Moses came within the cloud and he went up to the mountain and Moses was upon the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. He had nothing uh, but his staff, presumably, maybe even not, who knows, because he needed both hands 
for both sets of tablets, one in each hand, right? And so famously, in all the Midrashim, we have learned that the first tablets looked like sapphire, as we said, like sapphire stone, just like the staff of Moses, and just like the same material that we saw in Exodus 24.10. And they perceived the God of Israel, and beneath his feet was the forming of sapphire brick, and like the appearance of the heavens for clarity. Now, this is called Tachat uh, Kemase Livnat Asapil. Livnat Asapil is the lowest part of the seven firmaments, okay? It's called, its name is actually Livnat Asapil. But this is also presumably the stuff that the seed of glory is made of. Again, this is not a physical thing, okay? It's how it, ma it manifests physically looking like sapphire, but it's not sapphire like we necessarily know today, okay? And where else have we famously seen the appearance of this sapphire brick like we discussed? Ezekiel 1, 26. And above the expanse that was over their heads, like the appearance of sapphire stone, was the likeness of a throne. And the likeness of a throne was a likeness of the appearance of a man upon it above. We've been through this verse so many times, the likeness, the likeness, as in sort of the best way to describe it would be, and yet it is not a throne, it is not sapphire stone, and it is definitely not a man. You see, but the likeness, the likeness, the likeness. He saw this through so many filters, all right? Other places, they take it very literally. He saw a dude on the throne. Guess who that dude is? Wrong. Okay. So we understand from this, and again, there's so much more detail and so many more references, but I hope you get the point that the staff of Moses and the first tablets were made from the same sapphire-looking material taken from the throat of God. Okay? So let's continue. And Moses could no longer hold himself nor the tablets, says our text. The Radal explains what we just read. Moses was so exhausted from holding them up with his own strength that he actually fell with the tablets on the ground. In other words, he didn't just throw them. He didn't just fling them the way the text writes. It explains it. We'll get to it. All right. Meaning he didn't just drop them or dump them. God forbid. But rather, he didn't let go until everything went down. He held it for as long as he could, and then boom, he just fell with the tablets. As said in Exodus 32, 19, Now it came to pass, when he drew closer to the camp and saw the calf and the dances, that Moses' anger was kindled, and he flung the tablets from his hands, shattering them at the foot of the mountain. We'll discuss this a little bit later, but there are two actions here. Very interesting. So this may seem contradictory, but given all the new things that we just learned, this actually makes sense. Holiness does not abide in a place in a place that is not holy. And since the entire mountain was holy, remember Exodus 19, 12, and you shall set boundaries for the peoples around saying, beware by ascending the mountain or touching its edge. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. So the entire mountain was holy. When he crossed that threshold between the holy and and the unholy or the holy and the mundane, that's what happened. It lost its strength. Those boundaries were a mechitza, a divide, a fence, boundaries of holiness. And when the tablets felt the impurity, the moment Moses crossed that boundary, though it may have seen that Moses flung the tablets, we already know that no flinging could possibly have occurred based our understanding of the size and the weight of them. They just went straight down. But even more so, that it was the letters and tablets that threw themselves out of the hands of Moses. The letters ascended in the air and the tablets to the ground. There are even opinions that after they fell to the ground, these massive sapphire-looking stones, they did not shatter. They were very, very dense, okay? They would not just shatter if they fall to the ground. Remember, even the tablets themselves were holy. What happened to that supposedly empty, shattered sapphire tablets? It was placed in the Ark of the Covenant. In other words, the tablets themselves, even without the, the writing, without the letters, were holy, right? We still have them till this day in the Ark of the Covenant, along with the second tablets. And they are both one and the same. Another class, all right? So what happened over here? 
They did not shatter when they hit the ground. We said two actions took place over there, but rather it was Moses himself who shattered them once they were on the ground for the sake of protecting Israel. And we'll get into that as well. So again, we have, uh, we have covered this concept plenty of times over the years and specifically right here in Pirkei Dura Eliezer. But here's a brief understanding once again. Moses was the best man, right? Israel, the bride, God is the groom. All right. Moses was delivering the the ketubah, the marital document that every Jewish couple must have in order to officiate the union. This document is signed by two witnesses before a group of even more witnesses and the rabbi who is performing the ceremony. So the Torah, the tablets, is the binding document which would solidify the covenant between God and his beloved Israel. If Moses would have brought it to the place of impurity, the place in which Israel fell terribly by the hands of the heir of Rav, that would mean that Israel would be liable for complete annihilation because they utterly broke the covenant at that very moment. This is why we can further understand from the text that Moses did a good thing. Let's read Deuteronomy 10, 1 through 5. Remember when it came to matters such as these, specifically the welfare of Israel, Moses was unwavering, and everything he did was for their benefit. And at the end of each action and event, Moses repeats that everything that he did and everything that had transpired was exactly as God commanded it to be. Okay, so we're going to read it. Here we go. Deuteronomy 10, 1 through 5. At that time, the Lord said to me, hew for yourself two stone tablets like the first ones and come up to me unto the mountain and make for yourself a wooden ark like the first ones, meaning the same size as the first ones, right? And I shall inscribe on the tablets the words that were upon the first tablets, which you shattered, and you shall place them into the ark. Now, the Hebrew is like this. Ve'echtov, lichtov is to write, Al, upon, haluchot, the tablets, et hadvarim, these words, the, the, the things that I spoke, asher hayu al haluchot, that which were upon the uh, luchot arishonot, the first tablets, asher shibarta, which you, shibarta lishbor, shattered, broke, v'samtam ba'aron, and you shall place them into the ark. The word asher, also Asher is one of the sons of Jacob. What is the word Asher? Like Psalms 144.15. Ashrei ha'am shekachalo. Asher, Ashrei, Ashrecha. It's all the same word. Ashrei ha'am shekachalo. Ashrei ha'am she'adonai lo'av. What is Asher? Praiseworthy, praiseworthy is the people that has this. Praiseworthy is the people whose God is the Lord. So now the word Asher, it can also mean as translated, which you shattered, also in the beginning, asher hayu ala luchot, that which were upon the first tablets, right? But the Torah has a purpose for every word that is written. So this is no accident. Praiseworthy, good stuff. When we say right now, ashrecha, when I say to somebody, somebody does something kind, I say, ashrecha, that's praiseworthy what you did. God bless you, kind of a situation over there. In other words, Asher Shibalta, God told Moses, you did a good thing right there. Verse 3, so I made an ark of Akasha wood, and I hewed two stone tablets like the first ones, and I ascended the mountain with the two tablets in my hand. And he inscribed on the tablets like the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord had spoke to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire on the day of the assembly, and the Lord gave them to me. Now listen, and I turned and came down from the mountain and placed the tablets in the ark, which I had made, and there they were, as the Lord had commanded me. Ka'asher, here, ka'asher, here's another asher, ka'asher tzivani Adonai. So you see, everything is according to God's will, and everything is according, according to God's plan. This is written in the five books, meaning... It is true. So by default, it's an impossibility for things to happen against the will of God. If God is all-powerful, omniscient, omnipresent, eternal, not bound by space and time, which are just other aspects of creation itself, the creator of all things, of all the worlds and all of reality, then to think 
for a moment that something happened by happenstance. Oops, right? What a coincidence. That's going to get you killed. We know better than to believe in luck or in coincidence. And free will, the choices that we make, though, you, though they might be your own, the outcome is already adjusted for the choices that we are going to make from the very beginning of time until the end. Everything has already been factored in, you see? That's why there's one point and it's all perfect. And so the letters saw the drums and the dancing and the debauchery, and they themselves fled the tablets and flew away. And they, the tablets, were too heavy for Moses. And Moses could no longer hold himself, nor the tablets. And he dropped them from his hands, and they shattered. So like we said, they were too heavy for him to just throw them. He could not toss them. And considering their density... They were not likely to shatter from just falling. So Moses himself shattered the sapphire stones once they were on the ground after the letters had left in order to save Israel from complete annihilation. As said in Exodus 32, 19, now it came to pass when he drew closer to the camp and saw the captain dances, Moses' anger was kindled and he flung the tablets from his hand and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. Okay, we got that. Now, from our text, Moses then said to Aaron, what have you done to this people? Now, the way it's written in the Torah in Exodus 32, 21 is like this. Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you brought such a grave sin upon them? But you see how he approached him first? When Moses spoke to Aaron, according to the Torah, saying, what did this people do to you was a sign of respect that Moses had for Aaron. In other words, wow, I understand you didn't do this on your own, right? But what he really meant and what Aaron knew he was saying was, what have you done to them? Moses continued and said, you have exposed them like a woman who is unchecked from harlotry. The text in Hebrew says, otam The word to focus here is pera, parua, unruly, wild, exposed. Um, there was a, a, a cartoon character when we were kids called Yoshua Parua. Uh, Parua, why? Because he had long, unkept hair. So if, you know, you wake up in the morning, you got like a bed head, right, where your hair is all over the place. And sometimes it happens with my beard. One, like, part is there. Anyway, that's called, whoa, Atanira Parua Hayom, right? Or the Wild West. You know how we say the Wild West? In Hebrew, Hama'arav, Ma'arav is West, Haparua, the Wild West. So this word, Pera Parua, it's, it, it's all related to one another. And this is also the root of the name Paro, Pharaoh. You got that right. Now look what's written here in Exodus 32, 25. And Moses saw the people that they were exposed, for Aaron had exposed them to be disgraced before their adversaries. Listen to the Hebrew. Same letter, same letter, same spelling as Pharaoh. So why does our text in Pirkei Derabi Eliezer use the exact the example of Isha Pua? Right? Who is the Isha Pua? the Pu'a woman, the wild woman. This all comes from what the priest must later go through with a woman who is suspected of adultery. And where do you think that came from? But here, where Israel were suspected. Suspect, we all know, but it wasn't a full thing yet. Suspected of adultery. From Numbers chapter 5. It's going to read a few verses. Uh, let's read a few verses to make the point. The Kohen, we'll start with 17. The Kohen shall take holy water in an earthen vessel and some of the earth from the Mishkan floor. The Kohen shall take it, uh, take it and put it into the water. Then verse 18. Then the Kohen shall stand the woman up before the Lord and expose the hair on the head of the woman. He shall place her. She, he shall place it into her hands. The remembrance meal offering, which is a meal offering of jealousies, while the bitter curse-bearing waters are in the Kohen's hands. Okay. Now, 
Notice this where it says, and expose the hair of the head of the woman. From here we learn that a married woman who is, uh, who is uh, suspected of adultery, meaning she's married, must have their hair covered. This is not rabbinical. This is five books of Moses right here, meaning by default her hair should be covered because only when she comes to this thing should her hair be uncovered. Going to verse 21, the Kohen shall now adjure the woman with the oath of the curse, and the Kohen shall say to the woman, may the Lord make you for a curse and an oath among your people when the Lord causes your thigh to, repu uh, to rupture and your belly to swell. Again, you ha she has to say amen even to the curses. This is the same thing that happened when Israel came down, when Moses came down the second time. That's why it was more difficult. The first tablets, there were no curses. There were only blessings. It was like, yeah, sure, bring it on. The next time with the curses, Israel still had to say amen to both the blessings and the curses. This is where we see the concept in Deuteronomy, which is the more detailed account of the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai that they actually stood beneath the mountain. God lifted the mountain and said, if you don't say amen now, both to the blessings, duh, and the curses, mm -hmm, I'm dropping this mountain on you and I'm starting over with Moses. Okay? For these curses, for these curse-bearing waters shall enter your innards, causing the belly to swell and the thigh to rupture, and the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. In other words, I have to accept this, right? Then the Kohen shall write these curses on a scroll and erase it in the bitter water. He shall then give the bitter curse-bearing waters to the woman to drink, and the curse-bearing waters shall enter her to become bitter, okay? So she has to drink the water with earth and with the curse by which she is suspected of. Just like we're going to discuss next week, as Moses was doing to Israel the same exact thing with the water and the gold dust from the calf, i.e. the crime they were suspected of committing. All right? God being the husband, of course, and Israel his betrothed. And who was in the middle of doing this? It was Aaron, the priest. And when Moses called Israel exposed, what did he mean by this? to their adversaries. Just like we've learned, Israel was now exposed to death and sin once again, as the protected covering had been lifted off their heads. Aaron said to Moses, did you see what they did to Hur? I was terrified, he said. What Aaron was telling Moses here is not that he was afraid for his own life, okay? But rather he tried to buy Moses some time to return. We discussed why he did what he did. Also, if they were to kill Aaron, who was destined to be the high priest, who knows what kind of retribution God would have exacted upon Israel, especially since Aaron was the one who would be acting as a cleanser of the people, right? So let's take a quick look at Vaikra Rabbah 10.3. This is what it says. This is a, another beautiful take on this. It, it'll give us a better understanding. Rabbi Berkiya, in the name of Rabbi Abra Bar Kahana, interpreted the verse regarding Aaron. When Israel performed the act, the golden calf, initially they approached Hur. They said to him, rise, craft for us a god. When he did not heed them, they stood against him and killed him. And like we learned, he straight up rebuked them. What are you, nuts? You forgot what happened five minutes ago? Boom, killed them. This is what was written. Moreover, on the edge of your garments, the blood is found. This is Jeremiah 2.34. This is the blood of Hur. You did not find it while excavating, rather on all these, on Ele, Jeremiah 2, 34, because they committed the sin of declaring, this is Ele, your God, Israel, Ela, Ele Elohecha Israel, from Exodus 32, 4. Jeremiah was talking about what happened back then to what was going on in his day. Remember, he witnessed the destruction of the first temple. Afterwards, they approached Aaron. They said to him, rise, craft for us a God, Exodus 32, 1. When Aaron heard this, he was immediately afraid. Why? Right? That is, was, uh, that is what is written. Aaron saw to see, but also to fear, same word. And he built an altar, Mizbeach, before him, Exodus 32, 5. He was afraid, Nitiare. He became fearful due to the one slaughtered before him. Aaron said, what shall I do? They killed Chul. Who was Chul? Like we said, he was from the line of kings, from Judah. Chul was a prophet. He was a great man. 
Both his parents were prophets. Mother was Miriam. Now, if they kill me, he said, as I am a priest. Now, again, Aaron has been a prophet of Israel for 80 years, okay? Maybe a little bit less, but since he was a small child and Aaron was the leader of Israel. So he is no stranger to thing uh, of things to come, right? So he said, as I am a priest, the verse that is written will be realized in their regard. If a priest and a prophet will be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord, Lamentations 2.20, this is written by Jeremiah, right? And they will be immediately exiled. Again, this verse in Lamentations 2.20. If a priest and a prophet will be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord, they will immediately be exiled. So the, pro the, the prophet was already killed. If they kill a priest, it's over for them. He knew this. Remember, they just kind of came out of Egypt. They were still considered to be in exile as they were not yet in the land of Israel and the temple was not yet built. So they were already on the fence of what's going on over here. Very, very exposed position, position so to speak, and now even more so. Another matter, Aaron saw, Aaron, what did he see? If they built it, this one will bring a pebble, this one will bring a stone, and their labor will be completed all at once, right? Go get the, go get the jewelry, the gold from the women and everything. He, he thought of what to do, right? But if I build it, he said, I will be indolent, dragging my feet in my labor, and our master Moses will descend and do away with the idol. Everything he did was not for his own sake. And since I am building it, I will build it in the name of the Holy One, blessed be he. See, this is the same thing when you perform a mitzvah. Why? What are you focusing on and what are you thinking of? This is called kavanot. Kavana, it comes to the, from the word uh, lechaven. When you fire a gun, you have to lechaven. It's to aim. Kavenet is, the, uh, is what you would adjust um, your sights. That's called a, a kavenet. Right? So when you do kavanot, what is a kavanot? While I'm saying specific words, I'm focusing and thinking of specific, uh, of specific things, specific letters, specific letter combinations, what I want done from that. All these things are very much relevant. That's why we had so many classes on when you say something, it's not just about what you say, it's the right intentions that you have when you say it. Okay? Kavanah also means on purpose, rather with purpose. Okay, so that it is written, Aaron proclaimed and said, a festival to the Lord tomorrow, Exodus 32.5. I'm focusing on God when I'm doing this. This is all for God's sake. A festival to the calf tomorrow, it is not written, but rather a festival to the Lord tomorrow. And as we said, when he said that, that's where the calf stopped growing. Another matter, Aaron saw, what did he see? Aaron said, if they build it, the corruption will be ascribed to them. Let me now take it upon myself. Look at this greatness of this man. It is, um, uh, it is a parable. It is, excuse me, preferable that the corruption be ascribed to me and not to Israel. You see how Aaron took this upon himself for the sake of the people. Remember, Aaron was the Moses of Israel for 80 years before Moses' return. Like we said, he absolutely loved the people. He grew up with them. He knew them all personally. He was the leader. Moses took over for Aaron in the last 40 years. He knew them all personally, and he was with them every single day. Rabbi Abba Bar, Yud uh, Bar Yudan, in the name of Rabbi Abba, said, This is likened to the son of a king whose heart became haughty, and he took the sword to slash his father. His teacher said to him, Do not exert yourself. Give it to me. I will slash. Right? The king peered at him and said to him, I know what your intentions were, meaning to the servant, right? It is preferable that the corruption be attributed to you and not to my son. As you live, said God to Aaron, you will not move from my palace. What's God's palace? The temple, the Mishkan. You shall partake of all the remnants of my table, the Mizbeach, and you shall receive 24 stipends, right? These are 24 gifts. What is the significance of 24 gifts? There are 24 books in the Tanakh. It says that every groom should give his uh, bride, 
be on the wedding day or before the wedding day, 24 gifts, just like Moses was bringing the, the, the Ten Commandments, which is the entire condensed Torah, the entire Tanakh, to Israel, 24 books in the Torah. All right? but And where else do we see this 24? So too, you will not move from my palace. He shall not emerge from the sanctuary. Leviticus 21.12. The Kohen shall not emerge from the sanctuary. The place of the priests. You shall partake of the remnants of my table. The remnant of the meal offering shall be for Aaron and his sons. Leviticus 2.3. And you shall receive 24 stipends. These are the 24 gifts of the priesthood that were given to Aaron and his sons. The Holy One, blessed be he, said to Aaron, You love righteousness. Ohev, ohev tzedek, ohev shalom. This is what Aaron was. You love to vindicate my children and detest condemning them. Condemning them. Therefore, the Lord your God has anointed you. He said to him, as you live from the entire tribe of Levi, you alone have been selected for the high priesthood, as written in Leviticus 8.2, take Aaron and his sons with him. That's Midrash Rabbah. Beautiful. Okay? All right. So do you see how both Aaron and Moses were working hand in hand from the sides of mercy and judgment for the sake of Israel? Everybody had a job to do. Not only to protect them from themselves, but when they fall, Moses was right there to stand in the gap. No one man can do this alone. There's a reason that God selected seven shepherds to lead Israel, right? First, who's the first one? From the inception of our faith through Abraham to the solidification through Isaac to the realization of the promise through Jacob, Israel, to the ingathering of the people of the tribes through Joseph, the spiritual purity uh, building up through Aaron, to receiving the tools and guidance to rectify this world through Moses, to the establishment of kings and tribal unity through David, right? These are our Ushpizin. These represent the seven lower Sfirot, which we are currently going through right now in Sfirat Omer. These have established God's rule in the world. The bigger the fall that we all have as a nation, as individuals, the bigger the redemption, the greater the challenge, the greater the reward. Take these with you on your daily walk every single day and understand that whatever hole you might be in right now, it's temporary. It's not always going to be this way. But remember to take responsibility for your actions. And when you return from whence you came to your heavenly father, yes, you will not only understand why God is the one who put you through those challenges, but you are going to be a better person as a result. It's actually, it's a gift. You will see it only once you make it through. But when you're in it, what gets you through is faith. At the end, you receive knowledge. And when you have knowledge, there is no need for faith because you know. Faith is something that you don't know, but you believe, right? And when that happens, you will be humbled. Oh, I let me tell you something. You will be humbled because you realize that everything that God does to the tiniest little thing, everything he puts you through is for your benefit. If the golden calf was not the end of us, then whatever you got going on over there, you can handle it by design. This was tailor-made for you. Never give up. Take it one day at a time. You will make it through, even in the most trying of times. So that's today's class. Hope you enjoyed it. Stay tuned for next week as we conclude chapter 45 and the incident of the golden calf. And as always, thank you guys so much for joining me. Have a wonderful rest of the week and have a Shabbat Shalom. Bye-bye.